Hi, everyone. Welcome to a celebration of Nordic writers. We're thrilled you're here. My name's Clay Smith. I'm the literary director at the Library of Congress. And um, this is... My name is Frederikke Müller. I'm the lead of culture at the Danish Embassy. So um, Frederica is the person who first brought us here at the Library of Congress the idea of hosting Nordic writers and my colleague Troy Smith, who is our Nordic area reference librarian in the Latin American, Caribbean, and European division of the Library of Congress. And I sort of leapt on the opportunity. Um, it is not often that five embassies approach us and say, would you please do an event with our writers and we will fly them from, you know, their home nations. So we're just really thankful and I want to thank um, Frederica and all the cultural leaders of the um, five embassies whose writers we are featuring here tonight. And those are Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. So thank you. Um, now let me recognize a few people. I want to also welcome Ambassador Jesper Moller Sorensen of Denmark, Ambassador Svan Hilder Holm Valsdotir of Iceland, Ambassador Anakin Wheatfeld of Norway, and Ambassador, and I'm afraid I might mispronounce this, Lena Kaisa Mikola of Finland. Um, we're honored you're here, thank you. And Frederica has a few things to say. Thank you, Clay. Mm -hmm. So I can say on behalf of all my Nordic colleagues and myself that we are thrilled to be here at this wonderful library. It's just amazing every time you're here. Um, I'd say that Nordic literature is, is well known here in the US. It has a strong presence. And although the Nordic, the Nordic languages are minor languages, uh, Scandinavian fiction has still been, been um, actively uh, translated. Um, so, I think a lot of people know the Nordic countries through Hygge, this cozy feeling, and also happiness, but I would say our literature doesn't really depict that, or not always. <laughs> um, we, we definitely, uh, in our literature, have very strong emotions. We, um, we talk about uh, uncomfortable truths that can be climate, loss, rela relationships that are hard, so uh, I would say there's definitely a wildness to Nordic literature, um, and uh, I hope that you will take a deep dive into Nordic literature or, and the writers here tonight if you haven't already. And actually, to build on that, I mean, at our very first meeting about doing these events, um, we decided right, I think, in the first meeting to not do Nordic Noir. Nordic Noir is rightfully um, famous around the world, but we're trying to bring you a different side of Nordic um, fiction and nonfiction here tonight. So there are two panels tonight. We're about to start the first one. It's really about um, the depiction of the Nordic landscape in fiction and nonfiction. And uh, the second one is um, maybe the wildness that Frederigo was talking about, where we'll be talking about the Nordic soul, I think, in that one. So, um, Let's see here. Uh, I want to remind you that after each of the panels, the writers will be signing. Um, the books are for sale in the back of the room, and they will be signing in room 110, which is just down this beautiful hallway. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues from the Latin American, Caribbean, and European division because they have worked really hard on a display of Nordic items in the room right behind ours here. Um, and all everything that is on display in there is inspired by the five writers who we are featuring here tonight. So thank you again for being here. Uh, I want to welcome Anya Creighton, one of my colleagues here at the library. She is going to moderate our first panel, and the first two writers are um, Hannah Pilvinen and Josefina Klugart. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. OK, there we go. We can warm up. Forgive me one moment while I put this down. This seems kind of precarious. Um, OK. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Anya Kreitney. I work in the library's literary initiatives division. So that division puts together literary programming um, in collaboration with our colleagues here and various other divisions. So it's a delight to be with you. I'm going to introduce our lovely uh, authors here today, I'll give the, a bio, and then we'll just hop right into a discussion. Um, I think Clay mentioned that there are um, mics here for a question and answer. So please don't be shy and be thinking of your questions as the conversation is taking place, OK? So we'll start right here with Hannah Pilvinen, is the author of We Sinners and the End of Drum Time, which was a finalist for the 2023 National Book Award in Fiction. Her work has appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, among others. She's the recipient of many residencies and fellowships, including McDowell, Yaddo, the American Scandinavian Foundation, the Fine Arts Work Center, among others. She has taught at the University of Michigan or is still teaching on Mondays at the University of Michigan, uh, Princeton University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and she is currently the, uh, the lecturer of the year for the Finlandia Foundation. Josefina Klugart is considered one of the major voices of contemporary Scandinavian literature. Her debut novel, Rise and Fall, and her third novel, One of Us is Sleeping, both received <clears throat> the Nordic Council Literature Prize nominations, making her the first Danish author ever to have two of her first three books nominated for Scandinavia's most prestigious award. Her fourth novel, Of Darkness, appeared in 2014 to critical acclaim throughout Scandinavia and was published in English in early 2017 by Vellum Press. Please help me welcome them. <laughs> Hannah, I'm going to jump right in here with you. Um, the end of drum time is set in 1851 in a remote village near the border of what was once Sweden, Sweden and Russia, so, and very far north, very, very far north. Um, there's a Lutheran minister named Lars Levy Lestadius, and he is trying to convert the local um, indigenous population, the Sami population, who also happen to be reindeer herders. Um, it's also billed as a love story, but I'm sort of calling it a love conundrum, maybe is a better way of saying. And <clears throat> it does cross literal borders and cultures. It's also just beautifully written, everyone. So I, I want you to, to hear that. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading just the first two pages of the book, just so we can all hear your voice. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a bookmark there. It's also. The day of the earthquake was the darkest day of the year. This far north, what counted as day was just twilight stretched thin so that no shadows fell and the steeple of the church made no impression on the snow and the river and forest and hills were all suspended in the same half-finished light. The effect of this was a shared if unexpressed uneasiness, but most people were used to it. If given the choice, they would have said, let there be darkness, and gone back to their work. That was the sentiment, anyway, around people who had grown up here, Lars Levi among them. He found the cold and the dark invigorating. He was a man of extremes, and so he was drawn to extremes. They suited him. They spurred him on. But even he had to admit the morning was off kilter somehow. He had dreamed the night before of something of importance, what he couldn't say, and it troubled him that he might have missed its message. He was a man who put credence in these things and the importance of what was felt, in part because his mother had been that way and in part because the land made everyone here that way. No one could live beneath the northern lights and the midnight sun and not come out of it sure there was something besides rationality at work, least of all Lars Levi the pastor of this most northern parish for the past 22 years, a man of some hubris, but not a man who could be accused of insincerity. He was here to preach. He believed in what he spoke, but today he was especially sure of his purpose, and the weight of that purpose made him anxious. He paced up and down the side aisle, inventing little tasks to check on. Had Henrik rung the bell? Had Willa made the fire in the stove? The church was filling up, it really was, the Finns in their usual places toward the front, while behind them were the Laplanders, the Laps, the Sami, whatever you called them. He used Lap when he spoke to the Swedes, and Sami when he spoke to the Sami. 
and it occurred to Lars Levi that he was doing it. He had 829 parishioners stretched over 100 miles, and a good quarter of them were here. The Finns had skied for hours along the frozen river, and the Laps had harnessed their reindeer to the sledges, and they had driven 20, 40 miles through the snow to get here, to a tiny church village in Sweden where 10 of the 40 inhabitants were his own family. To hear him speak, him, Lars Levi Lestadius. But had Henrik rung the bell? Henrik had rung the bell, and then he had promptly gone back to his store, which was also his home, which people called the Dark House because you could get alcohol there, technically illegally. But in the first place, the law was impossible to enforce because too many people broke it. And in the second place, Henrik was not one to stand on principle. He was one to stand on getting himself out of debt. And moreover, he was of the opinion that the darkness was going to drive them all mad so they might as well go down drinking. He wasn't from here, and he hadn't grown up to be cold and call it happiness. My God, if he'd had the money, he would have left the day he'd arrived. He would have left, and he would not have come back. But since he couldn't leave this very end of the earth, he would, at the very least, leave all the talk about sinning to those who cared to sorrow endlessly over their sin. He, for one, was worn out by such talk and all the lecturing about drinking, sometimes from the very same people who came to him later on to buy something to drink. But more practically, there was a very good chance someone would sneak down during the service wanting to buy a bottle of something or other, and he couldn't lose the sale. And anyway, how could Lars Levi even notice if he wasn't there, now that so many came? Thank you. It was lovely to hear you read it. So, you know, I think we should first establish that um, Lars was a real person. And the beautiful thing about this passage is that you establish in just two pages, so many of the central uh, tenets that you that are so critical for Lars and his family, but also that are important to understand Lestadianism. So I just wonder, just so that we can be talking apples to apples here, tell us who's Lars, and tell us a little bit about what we understand, or ultimately Sami believes. Um, tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so Lars Levi Lestadius, real, real person, um, and um, I know him well, or which sounds weird (laughs) because he's quite dead. Um, Because I grew up in a fundamentalist Finnish church um, in the Detroit area, and there was always a portrait of him. So I knew what he looked like. Um, So very odd this many years later to then write a novel that opens with him in in, in his mind. And one of the things that um, I was most interested in trying to understand and that I wrote about, like one of the the lines there is, um, he wondered what it was his feeling knew first. And I think that's really the line that in some ways to me could sum up so much of what I learned writing this book and so much of what I think about now in terms of what it was that this religion I grew up in, which was started by him, Um, really taught me just as a person. And he, Lars Levi, this real person, um, his mother was Sami and his father was Swedish. But growing up, I was always told he was Finnish. My family was Finnish. We were Finnish. Um, Clearly, I'm American. You can hear that nice, strong Detroit accent in there. (laughs) Um, But my family is from Finland, um, going all the way back. Um, And I think that with Lars Levi, one of the things I was interested in trying to understand was what he had done with this kind of fundamentalism I had grown up in and how it was really in many ways rooted in Sami traditions and beliefs. So a lot of this has been about kind of trying to understand a kind of cross-cultural sort of, you know, um, what, like what parts of me are Finnish and what parts of me even though I didn't know it in this way, were actually Sami. And so much of what was Sami, I think, comes down to that phrase. Um, What was it his feeling knew first? The idea of feeling as knowledge and intuition um, as being prized over a kind of Western rationality. But it's also the beginning of your novel is also a masterwork of just craft. It starts with an earthquake, right? And pretty quickly, the characters don't expect how you might think they would behave. So, you know, Biatar, who is a uh, local herder, uh, he pretty much immediately decides, almost almost in this scene, basically to repent, stop drinking, give his life over to God. Um, 
then there's Willa, who is Lars's daughter, um, and she pretty immediately is discovering that she has feelings for Beatar's um, son, Ivar, and is questioning her faith. She's questioning she's feelings about her body and her place in the hierarchy and her family, and it's clear that she's a thinking person, and it's clear that she's taking this seriously. Um, you know, it felt to me like you were questioning or at least putting to us some contradiction in what we might assume of Lars, right? I didn't, not having known his history, I didn't, and I didn't know his mother was Sammy, I had preoccupations or, or um, what's the word, ideas about what his interests might be and was surprised to see him collecting Sammy's stories and archiving Sammy's stories. So clearly you're playing with our expectation. I don't know if you want to talk at all about that. It happens quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things that began to interest me really early on is that Lars Levi Lestati is the real person. Um, he wrote what is now considered one of the most full sort of ethnographies of the Sami people. Um, and at the same time, um, he the, the religion he, he started, the one that I was raised in, um, again, in the Detroit suburbs, um, that religion uh, started really from his own beliefs, which I, I think in many ways came so much from his mother. Um, but I, I would also say that he, um, be, I think because he was Sami, he didn't look down on his parishioners. So the Swedish state church historically, you know, as happened here in America as well, have been sending missionaries trying to sort of colonize via Christianity. And um, they were very successful at this in a lot of ways. They burnt sh shamans and drums. Um, and the Sami people quickly learned it was better to just sort of pretend to go along with it. <laughs> so Lars Levi is a real disruptor in this way because he doesn't look down at the Sami people and instead he embraces them um, probably because he really sees himself as one of them. And he says in his doctoral thesis, no man is better than a lap, which I can assure you is not something that any other Swedish priest or Norwegian would have said at the time. Um, so he, in his own way, I had started, let me start again, I had, when I began the novel, I had originally thought, oh, I come from a religion that once was used as a colonizing and oppressive force of an indigenous people, and I'm going to write a novel which somehow exposes this. This was my naive idea in like 2009. And then um, eventually, over the years, and after spending a lot of time with Sami reindeer herders in the north of Finland, um, I started understanding, oh, oh, okay, um, actually, they made this religion. And this religion arguably preserved aspects of their culture. It was a protest. It was a protest against the state um, because it wasn't a part of the, of the Swedish state church. You know, people were not fans of Lars Levi. I was grateful because I think you're starting from there, right? Getting to where you got to in your research complicated the text quite quickly, and it made the characters much more interesting um, and, and far more depth that you wanted to, you felt closer to them, or at least I did. I felt closer to them. They felt like, it, it almost out of time. It, they, I was very related to them. Josephine, I want to bring you into the conversation. You know, your novel of darkness is lovely, 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 searing. It's also hard to categorize, I would say. Um, to me, it felt sort of like a living dream, almost like a lyric examination of the paradox of looking intensely at something, looking very closely at something. It seemed to me that you were saying, we as people were always going and coming. Like, there's, there's no break, we are both alive, we are both dead at the same time, and our sight, despite all of our best efforts, fails us at times. Um, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading a short passage so everyone can hear from you as well, and I'll hand you the book. Anyway. What became of the crab apple tree, the one we planted in the back garden? Disease killed it, she says, aloofly, unmoved, as if having assumed nature's indifferent brutality, 
its indifferent nurture of all things, the dead, the living, a love for everything in any form that might remind one of indifference, but is the opposite, an attention to what there is. In all new forms, in all the forms being may assume, forwards and backwards in time, the opposite of nostalgia, not keeping anything for what it was, but perhaps retaining something or continuing to watch while something dissolves so that something else might emerge in its place. She considered it brutal, but at the same time rather elegant. She says this out loud, he nods, in concentric rings originating from a central source the disease spreads through the garden and in concentric rings the creamy spores advance within the fruit. She forms an eye with four fingers, the sound made by his shoes as he crosses the floor. Thank you. This is why I like the authors to read, because didn't you get more information from her reading? It was really beautiful. So this passage brings up a metaphor that you return to over and over um, throughout the entire book. Um, well, s uh, several metaphors. The passage of time, um, the eye is a, is a concept that repeats over and over, but also nature and its cause and effect and how something tiny can have long unintended consequences, almost as you say, concentric rings, like a, a tiny pebble in the water, right? Can you talk a little bit about the eye in the book and how you think about metaphor in the yes, book? Yes, It's a pretty important part. Well, yeah, and, and obviously this is not a, a, a regular novel. Yeah. I, I was very much in doubt whether to call it a long poem yeah. or a novel. And then I thought like this, well, we can't, uh, keep on reproducing like the idea that 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 novel this this form that is a bastard form in its origin a form that can do almost everything right uh, a liberating of language uh, we can't keep on like reproducing this uh, this certain like naturalistic uh, novel so so we I, I would like to like stretch our um, idea of what a novel could be. So I ended up deciding to call it a novel because obviously th there is characters here who uh, who change throughout the, the book. There are stable characters and, and there's a development, but maybe not as much in the characters, rather in, as you said, like the, the, the basic motifs of the, n of the book, of the novel. And one of these uh, is definitely the eye. Uh, another one would be um, that, of course, of uh, darkness as such, um, and that you could you could you could definitely pinpoint many of them. Also, the horse, for example. But you said that it was like a metaphor, and I I I, I see it in another way. I I, I very much uh, like the idea that that this novel is structured uh, of, um, of ch like a change of m metonymical images so that uh, in, the, in the tradition of uh, Bataille, show the French writer Georges Bataille, um, like that you, can, you can like follow an image or a motif throughout a book and that is just as concrete as following a person, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah, I, <coughs> I think um, describing the image as an anchor, like that helped me as I read. It instructed me to read the text because what I'll share with you all is that the, there are many forms. There may be what you call poetry, you know, prose poems, fragment poems. There's even a play toward the end of the, of, of the novel. So the novel is constantly reinventing itself over and over and over again, right? So what you learn in the first half, you abandon pretty quickly because then there's another part and another part and, the, and you're challenged to keep thinking, okay, how do I, what, 
how can I relearn how to read this book? Mm -hmm. And the image, the horse, the eye, and I see a lot of nature. There was, like, that's in part why I like the crab apple. I had you read the crab apple. Um, the light, the light is another one that reoccurs over and over and over again. And those were the things that anchored me throughout the text. So I see, I think you were very successful. <laughs> it worked for me, certainly. Good. I also know we were chatting a little bit before we were here tonight, and there's, um, you have a new book, um, After Nature. So here we were in Of Dark, now we're in After Nature. And there's a preface to this book that I think actually was quite instructive, uh, Josephina shared with me. Uh, reading the book itself, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading this little preface. It's quite philosophical, so you'll have to break it down for us and make sure that we understand. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. It was actually a passage from my latest Danish novel, All This Could Be Yours, and uh, the reviews on that book were very, uh, they were very happy about the, the books, uh, about the book, but there was this certain passage in the book, and um, a lot of uh, the reviews they draw this passage forward and says, "Okay, this is essential to the book and to Josephine Klugart's writing," uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's super interesting. And and there was like a couple of reviewers who were like, "This doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> why can't she just keep on writing like her novels and?" Uh, why doesn't she stick with the people and stop like being a philosopher? <laughs> and then, then when I had, I had to write another book, I, 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 I sort of I wanted to explain <laughs> this passage and why it is so important to me, but I think also just for the world right now. And I'll, I'll read it aloud. And that's the thing. That's th I put it as a motto for this for this next. It's a, a long essay about nature and art, and the state that the world is in now. A person's entire consciousness can concentrate on a small brass hinge, with a force that far surpasses that with which one delves into the biggest philosophical questions. The intellect can never muster such a profound and complex understanding as the one achieved by the mind's intermittent insight into the infinite, rich, infinite rich, richness and depth, depth of the concrete. The entire history of Western philosophy stands powerless against a brass hinge, a hollow of the knee, or a memory of lifting a sheet of ice from a horse's drinking water on a January night. So this passage, it's it's about it's about the power of the concrete. It's about the power of what you can see and touch and feel. And literature is all about this. Literature, as uh, an important philosopher, Søren Kierkegaard, says, is the most concrete of all art forms. It, it is super concrete. It lives through the images. It lives through what, what you can sense. And it creates a, like a, a physical philosophy that you can feel with your entire, uh, how do you say, um, I would say vasen. How do you say? Your yeah, entire being is not like it's not only it's, it's not your body. It's not the mind. It's like it's everything. And and I think, um, and I th I think this these times really call for a uh, uh, call for literature, call for uh, poetry, call for uh, some language that can bring us a deeper understanding of what it really means to be a human being. And I think in, in a Western context, uh, we have in some ways, we have been obsessed with the rational, logical thinking to an extent where other forms of knowledge here, including the, the knowledge you can gain from the aesthetics, from, the, from art, it, it has been looked upon as something that 
uh, it's nice to do in your sp uh, spare time. <laughs> it's like uh, cream on top of the cake. It's like something. Uh, it's something women can do in a corner, <laughs> and that's very cozy, right? But but uh, but but as all the big philosophers, where you look out, you know, can't heal. Uh, you can go on. They all uh, pinpointed this that that aesthetic thinking, aesthetics as a as a way of gaining true knowledge about the world. It's the the basic um, level of understanding that has to be there in order for a society and a culture not to dissolve into darkness. Uh, and when you look around these days, you really th think that, um, that that is what we need. We need something else. Uh, Hill is, is talking about world wisdom. And I really think that that is what, uh, what literature, what poetry can, can bring us. And it, I would like to say that today because we're here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very appropriate place to say this, but I think it's a very, an, an extremely important point to make in the midst of a nature crisis like this. I agree with you. I mean, I can tell, because of your central sort of preoccupation or your thinking, I can tell that you are moved by poetry. I mean, above and beyond the poetry that you've written in Of Darkness, because your mindset to me seems very, um, poetry is about, almost about the ineffable, the, 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 the sensitivities of things, the, the unknowable parts of things that are actually quite quantifiable and that are quite meaningful. And ironically, I think are the things that connect us all. And so I think, you know, well said, because I think of darkness proves what you're describing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I also want to say that we are here in part to talk about the sort of break from stereotype in terms of these two books, how they differ from either traditional uh, Nordic literature or landscape, right? So I feel inevitable that we, I mean, I, these books do so much more than that, so we could be here for another hour, but I feel we should also uh, stick to the topic at hand to some degree. Uh, the rule follower in me is saying as much. Um, so, I, Hannah, I want to bring you back into this conversation. And, you know, as you described, the border is a slippery business in this book, right? It's, it's constantly permeable. It's not even clear who is ruling, what area, what languages are being spoken, depends on where you fall in this hierarchy. Um, and so I wonder, you know, how can you talk a little bit about the sort of mutability of the characters because they themselves are constantly on the verge of some inner uh, change or terrain. And so I'm wondering, like, how did you match the terrain to the characters, right? Because there's some symmetry there. I'm kind of thinking about that. Oh man, the terrain to the characters. You know, um, yeah, and I, I have to say, I, I agree with so much of what you were, you were saying and there's so much in our books, oddly enough. Um, because one of the things I w was thinking about was how um, extreme places can make extreme people, right? And one of the things that's unusual about being that far north, of course, is um, it's such extreme and wild beauty. And, and, and actually, just like as a little fun fact, this cover is actually a photograph. Um, the only thing they changed is they swapped out the snowmobile tracks for um, footprints. Right, but, but, but that's Northern Finland. Um, the, the filter was also not adjusted. That is the color, right? I was there, it was minus 40 degrees <laughs> in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, and I think one thing that, that does, right, to human nature is, I, it's easy to think of the cold, the tundras, anything snowy. I think in our minds, we immediately go to something kind of, you know, both like frozen, but also reserve or, you know. And one of the things that was interesting to me um, growing up as, you know, a Finn, a Finnish American, you know, is that there is sometimes um, a kind of stereotype of Finns and, you know, lots of like fun little jokes about Finns about how reserved we are. And I started to realize at some point though, I was like, actually, it's another kind of extreme. You know, I remember the first time I went to Finland and I met this man who was a pianist and I went into his home and the only thing in his house was his piano and like a mattress. 
And, <laughs> and he was so quiet. He would like hardly speak to you. And of course, he did all of his speaking through his playing. And I thought, this is not a quiet man. This is not a man of reserve. This is a, this is a person of great, great passion, right? Almost so much passion that it doesn't come out in this more traditional American chatty way that I've now learned four generations later. But I think in terms of my characters in the book, one of the things I was interested in trying to do through literature, because I was so interested in the question of feeling, is really think about them as beings of feeling. And I think especially with historical literature, it's an easy trap to fall into, that historical literature can kind of come, become about the stuff, like the filigree, it can become about the research, right? And instead, I was really trying to think, how do I get it more about the people? How do I get more into the concrete? How do, you know, and that was why when I was there, um, you know, doing my research, it was so essential to be there because it's one thing to sort of think like, oh, reindeer, look at their fur. And another thing when you're drinking your coffee and it's in your coffee, right? I mean, those are two separate experiences. <laughs> So it's very important, I think, and I think that is the job of literature. So you can, and I did a tremendous amount of research for this book, and it would be very often the case I would read some sort of, you know, missionary journal or something, and that would tell me facts. How many people have, you know, smallpox or something, and who's being inoculated, and great, fascinating, but I'm sitting there and I'm like, but what kind of spoons do they have? You know, and then what is it, what does the spoon feel like? Like, I, I, it's what I need to know. And where you find that information is literature. Literature is where, is where, in art, that's, that's where all of that is. Um, I spent so long, you don't even want to know, trying to figure out when they brought coffee that far north. And I learned it's all about taxes because everything's about taxes. And that's why Finns, myself included, drink so much coffee. No, it was just because I realized you asked me about borders, and then, <laughs> and I, and I never spoke about borders. <laughs> Coffee is a big, you know, as you can imagine, is a big part of this book in terms of um, greeting one another, celebrating with one another, and anyway, you were talking about a spoon. What does a spoon feel like? I would say your book seems apart from some of the historical fiction that I've read for this very reason, because it felt almost out of time to me. It felt almost. Um, I mean, I knew it was 1851, but the characters, their intimacy, even though she's omniscient, she's writing it as if she knows everything. Um, I do but it, know everything. But, <laughs> but it's close. You really have the sense that you understand the characters and their motivations and their, their wishes. Um, they don't feel as if they're being reported to you, which is sometimes what happens in historical fiction. Um, Josefina, I agree with so much of what you said, especially in this moment of sort of existential climate crisis that we're in. Um, I noticed also in your book that nature doesn't behave, right? It doesn't do, it doesn't um, follow traditional rules. And I, maybe, maybe it's a fool's errand to think that we're ever in control. I mean, here we sit, there's a, a hurricane a brewing not far from us, right? So clearly we're not in control. But I also started to think a lot about the nature in your book. And wh its role, like, it, what do you think, how did you think about it as you wrote the book? And I started to think about our complicity, like, is anyway, if you want to react to any of that. Yes. Yeah. Um, nature, of course, for me, is like a, a major theme in my books. And actually, I never decided that it should be. It, it just was like that from, from the very beginning. Um, and the funny thing is that my, f my first novels, they were a lot about uh, how our language and, and consciousness kind of grow from the landscape that we uh, are, are born into. Uh, there are a lot about the, the special part of Denmark where I grew up that's called Malt Mountains. And the ones of you who have been to Denmark, you will be laughing now because Denmark is a super flat country, <laughs> so <laughs> that we, you know, mountains, come on. But still, it's it, like, it's the most uh, hilly uh, place in Denmark. And it's like an, an, a nature, um, how do you say, uh, re reserve, like, like a national park, actually. 
um, like preserved nature area. Uh, and I grew up there, and uh, and I, you know, all, I always think that that I, I want to describe something like that happens between people. That's my motivation for writing. Something that I don't understand. Something that's a grief or sorrow in my life that I can't, uh, you know, uh, something I can't penetrate with my thought and get a, a grab around. And then I start writing about it, and then nature just comes along. <laughs> And why is that? That is, of course, because literature grows from the concrete. It is never situated in an empty space. It's always um, relying on the language ability to create new worlds. And, and, and you cannot inv invent something that you don't know about. That's the real problem with like writing historic fiction, as you said. I, in some ways, it's, it's super challenging because you're describing a world that that you don't really know. And I have been. Uh, my latest novel was also partly historical fiction, and it's a very very different process. Also because I think it's so interesting to hear about like that research thing, and because there's so many exciting and, and challenging thing about that because it's also a question about how, from where do you write? What kind of state do you have to be in to be able to create art? And uh, it's like two different departments <laughs> of the cognitive faculty. So it's like um, in, in order to create, you have at some point you have to, as you said, put, put, the, put away the research and start creating. Uh, the writer Nabokov says that all literature has nothing to do with the world that we live in. It's always a brand new world. And when you start reading a book, you must put everything aside that you think you know about the world, and you must learn, and, you, know, you must start all over again, entering this brand new world that every novel is. And, I've, and that's, I think it's, it's um, a very important thought to hold together with the thought that as a writer you you have to use your everything you remember about the world and uh, those two things y you have to like do simultaneously yeah it I don't know I didn't answer your question no, at I love all it. did I <laughs> we could be talking for hours I mean it occurs to me as you're talking that both of you are probing in entirely different ways in your books and um, Josefina, I see you returning again and again, and you said, I'm, I'm trying to figure out something that I don't understand between people, or something that I haven't quite grasped, and you can feel it in that darkness, and you can also see the moments where she makes insight, where she has, she is, finds an answer to something, um, and so as a reader, it's so pleasurable, because you get to see your, um, your thought process, it was really pleasurable, and Hannah, I also see someone who's probing in your characters, who are themselves um, so 360 and um, allow for themselves to have slippages and and you know awkwardnesses and um, misconception and um, and at the same time real softness like there's ways in which each of the characters are soft in ways that you don't expect so I see both of you playing with expectation in a way I'm going to open it up to question uh, questions in just one minute so don't be shy the microphones are right here um, before, before we go to questions, I, I want to ask you a little bit about this, this season, right? Because in, in your novel, we see the full season. We see the Sami in their full um, seasonal process, maybe would be a way of saying, which seemed really critical. And it reminded me, because you were saying, the mountains in Denmark, what we don't expect, right? And in Hannah's book, there's this lush, lush scene in part two, um, without giving anything away plot-wise, um, and it's all green, and it's warm, and it's summer, and it's luxuriant. It's sort of the opposite of what you might expect with a book that looks like this, right? That takes place way, way north. And so another way to reinvent and, and uh, break with expectation. How important was it for you? Because this is an important part to the Sami, uh, the earmarking tradition, um, the process of slaughtering the reindeer, so on and so forth. So tell us a little bit about that part. Yeah, so like Josefina was saying, is the act of writing this novel um, could not 
be separated from nature. So much so that when I was writing it, I built what I called my novel wall. Um, and uh, just huge sheaths of paper where I would track where all the characters are doing at any given point. But I was also tracking how much sunlight is there at this time of year. What are the reindeer doing? Where are they in their cycle, right? What's happening with their antlers? Are their antlers fuzzy or are they coming in? Did the, did the you know, male antlers, reindeer lose their antlers yet? You know, um, that kind of thing because it was so essential. It wasn't so much about getting it right in a research way, although that's of course important too, but there's this kind of truism that they say in writing, you know, like if you, you know, in a writing program or something, and they say plot comes from character. And this idea being that, you know, you don't ever as a writer want to write something where you're so interested in, in the idea of like a plot twist or something that it's not believable for the person doing it. But I realized when I wrote this novel that that was wrong for this novel because plot had to come from the reindeer, which is another way of saying plot had to come from the nature because that really was the organizing force of the world. Because in a, in, in, when you're in the land that way, you are forced to recognize that you don't, you don't own it, <laughs> you don't control it. You know, control is an absolute illusion and delusion, right? Um, and so um, one of the things I was trying to show both in how like the characters sometimes talk to each other, you know, if someone says, you know, oh, well, what are we doing tomorrow? They're like, do I look like God? Do, do I look like I know what the reindeer are doing tomorrow to you? You know, and um, so I try to show that both in like the, the characters and how they speak with each other, but of course also just in the fact that what's happening in the outside world is not incidental. Right, I think in a contemporary time, it can feel like what's happening is incidental, right? But that's actually also its own illusion and I think delusion. I think it's also right that that would be an organizing principle of this particular book and helped you avoid the trap. I know you studied Claudia Rankin and so on and so forth, this idea, this um, coming from a particularly, let's say, white perspective. Um, because if you were caring about the reindeer, that meant that the author had a different philosophy. You were organizing the book around a different philosophy, which to me seemed right, um, or else it could be dangerous. I mean, or else you could be recommitting other, you know, horrors that have been done in the name of colonization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this yeah. goes back a bit to your border question and also to the question of what is the job of literature. And one of the things that Claudia Rankin um, poses in uh, one of her books called The Racial Imaginary, which was very important to me in the writing of The End of Drum Time, where I was thinking a lot, what does it mean that I'm white, that I'm Finnish, that I'm American, that I'm also trying to write about an indigenous population? Was she poses this question, the part of the question is, we know literature can and has done great harm. We know that. So the question is, can it do something else? Can we ask literature to do more? So one of the things I was interested in, part of the reason I even wrote in Omniscience, right, is because I was interested in trying to take this idea of how we've always told stories and say, you know what, I'm gonna tell a story, I'm going to be a storyteller, I'm gonna be completely honest about my role as a narrator. I'm, I'm narrating, I'm a fallible human being. <laughs> And my goal in narrating is to make us all feel more aware of the construction of narrative, right? And the ways it can work in both good and harmful ways. But I also think it was smart in that you owned your own whiteness to say, I will never be Sami, you know? And this is one way in which I can tell the reader and be honest with the reader. And at the same time, I you embedded yourself with, with Sami family. They, Many times, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I thought it was very delicately done and very smartly woven. So I just wanted to you all to hear that. Um, ask one more question, Josefina, about the about lyric, right? Because the book is very indebted to the lyric voice. Um, people say this often, often time in poetry: the lyric, the lyric, the lyric. What does it mean to you? How do you how do you 
Um, how did it feel right to you? Because reading it, it felt very present to me. But what, what it, it's it's clearly a voice for you in Of Darkness. What do you think about it? You talked a little bit about this with me. Yes, um, I really struggled about finding a form for this yeah. novel. I had all these, I, I always have this uh, way of writing where I just open the document on the computer and then I just start writing without knowing where I'm going. Uh, and then when I have 200 pages, I send it off to my editor who sends me back the 30 pages he likes the best. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I, it's a very, I can't recommend it because it's like you produce so much text that will probably never be in a book. So it's like a super stupid way. But the, the reason why I'm doing this is, is that I'm a, a, I, I, I have this tendency to have figured out S f f figured out what kind of book I'm writing. <laughs> and that's a very bad way to write a book because you, ha you, you have to write a book that's wiser than yourself. And the only way to do that is to make language work for you because language is so much wiser than yourself, right? So you have to like um, f f find a way to 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 yeah to like um, stop like that intellectual part of your brain that, that wants to control it and do something super smart with literature and instead trying to be a bit more like nature <laughs> I, I i think that that's that's maybe a, a, an important point to make that that actually um M making uh, uh, children <laughs> and making books that's like the two things that you can do where you you're uh, as close to nature as you get in <laughs> right it's an experience that that you can you can from nothing create something and that's the experience of creating form in a world of fabulous forms like y you know n never ending varieties of form that is beauty. Creating beauty is also a way of experiencing yourself as nature, of that form-producing power that is nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with so much of what you said. Does anyone have a question? There are standing mics here. Don't be shy. No questions. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Sune, I'm a Dane living in America, and I was just wondering to both of you about the translation process uh, into English, because I'm also from Jutland, like Josephine, and I feel like there's a lot of culture clash built into being from Jutland and speaking in English. And I don't know if your book was translated to Finnish, but I'm just curious about what was particularly hard to translate. Yes, um, I have. Uh, I have my, my translator is called Martin Aikind, and he's a very, very good uh, translator. And he 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 doesn't ask me m much, but sometimes, of course, he sends an email and um, and have questions. Um, of course, I, well, there is a lot of of old language in my books, and I think that is like old wor words for something super weird and the translators often uh, are like okay what is this thing i have uh, looked it up everywhere i can't find it and it, it could be like all the farmers tools that i grew up with uh, yeah that's uh, you know, you're from jetland yourself you know uh, you, you uh, the crazy thing about a uh, 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 land as uh, denmark is that Everything is like is four hours away from uh, the capital. You, you can't go any further. But still, th the language is so different. When you go to the Jutland, when you go to Mölz, it's like an ancient language. And people always sometimes say that to me, how, how, why do you write so like old school with all these weird old, <laughs> old words? And I'm, that's, what, that's what they're called, these things that I was surrounded with in my childhood. So often it's like words like this that we discuss, but I, I you know, it's uh, he does a great job. I think it's it's very difficult to translate, also because it's very lyrical. Yeah. It it seems that the more lyrical text get, the more challenging 
it is for they have to you yeah like make children make literature they have to uh, create something new <laughs> yeah yes i think for myself actually one of the things i realized was that even writing in english um i already was a translator like i was already translating an experience from northern scandinavia to an american reader and so much of it was a labor of translating, translating cultures across cultures to another culture, right? I mean, it was completely exhausting. <laughs> and every decision I just had to labor over, for instance, do I put the accent marks over characters' names? Um, I was told, you know, some people thought, well, that's, that's distancing, an American reader doesn't want to, you know, deal with that, basically. Um, so, so, even that small choice, right, just became uh, its, its own <laughs> intercontinental dilemma <laughs> and its own translation decision. And not to mention, which I'm writing about characters who are Sami, characters who are Swedish, characters who are Finnish, characters who are Russian, characters who are Norwegian. Um, and so at different points, they might use words, of course, that, that of course an American reader is probably not gonna know, but also that they, are not gonna necessarily know amongst each other. So I was also having to make a lot of different decisions about, okay, wh what point do I use the word as it is used in that culture? And or at what point do I offer an American translation? And what do I even decide is going to be the American, you know, translated word and what I kind of ended up falling back on was if there was a word in that culture that I was wanting to use that I could not think of a there there, there is not a good replacement <laughs> um, so for instance like the name of a place right um, I wasn't going to make that up I was going to go with what's the name of this place who's the character who's using it what's what's the language of of this place that they would use right so that my Reasons were always coming, again, from character. I just have a question for Anne of clarification. I may have misheard this, but I thought I heard you say um, that literature has done great damage in the past. And I wondered if you could give us some examples of that. I'm trying to think of it. I mean, to me, literature is mostly a positive. I, I can think of maybe German Lebensraum novels or something like that, but go ahead. Yeah, so there's a really unfortunate tradition, um, partic and I, I'm speaking almost exclusively right now about the American canon, but of white writers writing about cultures that are not white, I'm doing a pretty bad job of it. Um, and I would say specifically um, writing characters, you know, who are stereotypical, right? Um, Probably the most famous example we have is just Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, I mean, there are there are many. I mean, now arguably there's even like Catherine Stockett's The Help, for instance. And so one of the things I was worried about was participating in a really unfortunate tradition in which it's easy to imagine that because you're a writer that you can imagine anything right, including the lives or experiences of others when you didn't actually grow up around them. You didn't grow up in the same way, right? So um, I, the, the history that I'm speaking of, I would say, is really about as long as, as literature itself. I mean, I'm even thinking when I was doing the research for this book, I, re I read Johann Schefferus's um, uh, description of Lapland from, I want to say the 1600s, right, where he basically portrays Sami people as like pagans who roll around in the dirt, right? So um, that was sort of a tradition that I was trying to write against, and again, by like emerging, uh, or sorry, immersing the, immersing the prose inside feeling and get giving everyone feeling first. I have to disagree with you totally about Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin helped to bring on the Civil War and the ultimate end of slavery in the United States. It was a very positive novel which brought tremendous sympathy toward the black people. And to use 21st century sort of woke attitudes about Uncle Tom's Cabin, I think um, really does historical injustice. 
Yeah, I mean, I disagree. Um, I, 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 it's, a, it's definitely an important, it's an important conversation. And I think especially in America, as Americans, it's an important conversation. And it's one that I'm aware that I, I participate in, that we all participate in, um, regardless of what, what we're doing, um, but especially as writers. And um, I think that, you know, rather than sort of get bogged down in a particular question about Uncle Tom's Cabin, although I think there's um, really a lot of research and scholarship out there that's really rich and rewarding to read about that. Um, no matter what, I do think that, you know, the, the job of, the, of, the, of a writer above all is to take accountability and responsibility um, for what you write. Well said. You can see that these two women are deeply thinking and deeply moving. So please, let's give them a round of applause.